Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum, and I have a whole slew of questions from you guys today. As always, these come from our uh, fabulous Patreon supporters. You guys make the channel possible. So let's get right into answering some of your questions. I'm going to start with a question from KP. He says, are belt-fed AR uppers a viable alternative as a replacement for things like the M249? I've seen pictures of AR-10 belt-fed uppers being tested before. What was wrong? Could modern materials and techniques solve its problems? Uh, they're not really an option. People have tinkered with them in a number of forms. Uh, there were, in fact, or there was, a belt-fed version released with the AR-10 back in the 50s, um, notable for being issued with a backpack and a like flexible belt chute that wrapped around into the gun and dude looked like Rambo or something. Um, they've also been tried in a number of different configurations on the AR-15. Uh, the Shrike LMG upper is still a thing that's out there and being sold. Ultimately, the problem that has pretty much always cropped up uh, is durability. The AR-15 upper receiver just is small. It was kind of designed to be small and compact and light. And when you try and add in all of the elements required for a belt feeding system and belt support, it can be done. The Shrike, for example, works, but none of these things really function reliably or have the durability for military usage. When you start putting tens of thousands of rounds through them, they fail. Uh, parts break. There just isn't enough space to make the parts strong enough to make them durable enough to satisfy a military requirement. And they're always kind of disadvantageous compared to a purpose-built light machine gun like an M249. So on the civilian side, yes, they can work. Um, I've ne I don't actually have any hands-on experience with one of the, the Shrike uppers, but I know there are a couple different ones out there. And they do function um, for a civilian sort of application, but they've never really been sufficient for militaries. Uh, next, from Watch It. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, I can understand, let's see, I'm particularly interested in the Pedersen, and especially its 276 round. I can understand MacArthur's reasons for closing down the project and forcing the army to stick with 30 out 6. With hindsight, that was the correct choice. But can you shed any light on why the U.S. Army seemed all set to adopt a similar intermediate bullet, albeit a loose uh, interpretation rather, uh, as it would have been rather on the high end, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, and then post-World War II, insisted on adopting what was basically full power, uh, a full power round in the 7.62 NATO. I don't understand the change in attitude, as every other major power had concluded from their wartime experience that intermediate rounds were the way of the future, and had either fielded new rounds, like the 8 Kurtz or 7.62 by 39 or uh, else were involved in their development, like the 280 and the 75 by 38 I can understand the argument for keeping their standard round at point thirty, as the U.S. had huge uh, manufacturing capacity for making rounds and barrels in that caliber, but why did the U.S. Army do a complete about-face in its small arms thinking regarding low-powered uh, rounds, when it had been an advocate of the policy before the war, and arguably one of its primary proponents? I think the, there are some, some rational you know, explanations for you know, specific reasons that were cited for the thirty caliber cartridge being more desirable. Those aren't necessarily correct in hindsight. But I think the most fundamental thing to point out here is that there was no unitized opinion of the American military or government establishment. What you always have here in the US and in every other country are a bunch of competing schools of thought with varying numbers of members. You'll have these officers think that a, an intermediate power cartridge is the way to go. These officers all think that it should be a full power cartridge. And, you know, you may have some guy off on the side who thinks they should be issuing belt-fed 22s to everybody. What actually causes decisions to be made is basically which school of thought can get the most members and can then convince the specific decision-making people that they are correct. So it may very well be the case that, you know, in the 1920s, and this is in fact true, in the 1920s there were a lot of people who were advocating for a full power cartridge, for sticking with a 30 out 6 But the group of people who wanted the 276 cartridge were vocal, and they had good arguments, and they were able to convince almost enough people, up to the point that they hit MacArthur, that their idea was right. But you can always be in a situation where, you know, think of uh, you know, a congressional body with 100 members, 49 to 51 makes the decision in favor of the 51, if you get two people to change out of 100 members, now you've got 49-51 going the other way, and you can have the opposite decision 
very shortly thereafter. And it may look like the entire country has changed its opinion, uh, but in reality all you did was just enough to sway the balance to make the decision the opposite way. So there were certainly European, uh, there were elements of the European militaries that wanted, that had the same sort of division as in the American ones. Note that the Swiss, for all of their experimentation uh, with lots of German gun technology and smaller cartridges, the, the Swiss were tinkering with 7.5, basically 7.5 Kurtz after the war quite a bit. They ended up sticking with their full power 7.5 by 55 cartridge for quite some time. Uh, the French ended up with the 7.5 French, which was, well, they stuck with it after World War II as well. Um, none of these things are, are you know, hundred percent decisions. So I think I think that's the primary uh, point that's important to understand why the U.S. made these decisions. Just a few people changed in the right positions of authority to change the U.S. decision-making priority. There were a lot of people after World War II who were very much in favor of a smaller cartridge, but they didn't end up having uh, the decision-making authority or the being able to convince the right people. Uh, Ilya says, how and why did the Finnish military end up using 762 by 39 millimeter ammunition, and why do they prefer Soviet-style weaponry? This is actually a pretty simple one, and it comes from uh, the question of do you want to build your own giant stockpile of arms and ammunition, or do you want to just let the Soviet Union be your stockpile of reserve arms and ammunition? Uh, in Finland, they don't have the economy or the military strength to directly compete with the Soviet Union. Uh, should they get invaded again. And so what they do instead is focus on training. They have a very large uh, reserve force, and if you're going to pick a cartridge, why not pick the one that your most likely military aggressor or military opponent is going to be using against you? It's worked really well for them in the past. They were able to capture large amounts of Soviet ammunition, uh, stockpile, uh, ammunition, supplies, weapons, you name it. Uh, it is, in fact, that, that's what originally caused the Finns to adopt the Mosin Nagant. Uh, when Finland got its independence uh, in the late 19-teens, they basically took over a couple of large Soviet stockpiles of, of weapons that were in what is present-day Finland, and that was mostly Mosin Nagants. So that gave them a great head start on rifles and ammunition, and so they stuck with that. And I think it was basically the Soviets adopting 762 by 39 that caused the Finns to decide that, well, if we want to upgrade from our uh, Mosin Nagant rifles, we need something new. The AK is a pretty good rifle. If we have to fight the Soviets again, that's what they're going to be using. And um, through the Cold War, there was a lot of material aid between Finland and the Soviet Union. So that also helps. Um, the, the Finns used a lot of Soviet armor um, during the decades between World War II and the present day. Uh, Billy says, besides the Chris Vector, are there any other guns that have mechanical recoil compensation built into them instead of standard muzzle devices? Uh, would the AN-94 qualify as one since the two-shot burst is fired before recoil hits your shoulder? I would say yes, the AN-94 definitely would qualify as something like that. Uh, recoil mitigation is tangentially the purpose. The direct purpose is two shots on the same point of aim, but that requires recoil mitigation to achieve. Um, one other military rifle that immediately came to mind for me was the FG-42. It is set up with a basically a big spring buffer between the receiver and the buttstock. So when you fire, the receiver actually reciprocates just slightly in the buttstock, and that absorbs some of the recoil impulse, and then the rest uh, hits the shooter. That was present in both, well, all major, all the production patterns of the FG-42. Uh, the South African 20mm Neopup um, shoulder-fired cannon, basically, uh, uses a very similar system where the action reciprocates into the stock to help absorb some of the recoil. And then the other place where you see a lot of this is in competitive shotgun shooting. So the guys shooting trap and skeet, uh, there are a lot of different systems made for those shotguns to absorb recoil. And typically what they're going to uh, consist of are uh, weights that can move. So often you'll get like mercury systems and what this forces the, it effectively increases the, the weight of the gun. And it takes a lot more of the energy to move this mass inside the gun before that energy can then be transmitted to the shooter. Um, there are some that are a little more mechanical where there's actually, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, unfortunately, but um, there's one I want to say it was a Browning gun, but I could be wrong on this, uh, where they basically replace the magazine tube with a gas piston, 
and they just vent some of the gas from the uh, action down into this piston that does nothing except move, and in moving it absorbs some of the energy uh, from the system and thus reduces recoil. So yeah, uh, interesting that it's a lot more prevalent on sporting guns than on military arms. And I think probably because it tends to make guns heavier, which isn't a good thing in a military context, and it typically tends to make them uh, less reliable, more bits uh, to go wrong in there. Like the AN-94 is certainly an example of. So, uh, And the military maybe isn't that concerned so much as sport shooters who are competing for the slimmest margins of time. Uh, Donald says, have you considered a, doing a deep dive into the pistols of Krunka? K-R-N-K-A. Uh, I love the videos where you deep dive into a firearms lineage, such as your series on the Bergman pistols or Winchester lever actions. Yes, uh, Krunka's pistols are definitely on my list. I think I have a source lined up where I can get a good sampling of them. Uh, what has prevented me from doing them thus far is that they are a pretty darn obscure gun, uh, and they're, so far there have always been things that I feel are a little more interesting or a little more um, well suitable for video. So I need to find some good information, historical information on Kernke. There's one good German book and I need to go through and deal with translating that and being able to read it and getting a, a better feel for the history and then access to the guns. And yes, there will be a series on Kernke pistols coming. Let's see, next up from Christian. I've been wondering, are there any known surviving examples of the Vampir Wampir? Probably Wampir, because it's German. Uh, Night Sight. The collector grade Sturmgewehr book says there are about 200 made. Uh, interestingly, I was just asking someone about this recently, and I have never seen one in person anywhere, actually, including the museums I've been to. Uh, but I am told that there is in fact one somewhere in the US. No idea if it works or not. I would expect it probably doesn't work. But yeah, apparently there is at least one in the US, and I would be surprised if there wasn't at least one somewhere in Germany probably in one of the big museums. Uh, I have not had a chance to visit any German arms museums yet. So uh, yeah, there's at least one. Hopefully I can find it. If you happen to know who owns the Wampir night site for the Sturmgewehr here in the US, uh, let me know. Send me an email. I'd love to hook up with whoever, that, whoever has that thing and do a video on it. Uh, next question is from MFJ. It says, uh, the question depends a lot on size, but I will ask anyway. Was it possible for entire countries to arm their forces and supply them with the same weapon, ammo, equipment, etc., by buying surplus for other countries? For example, after a World War, War, World War, or because a country was upgrading its forces? Yes, and there are a couple cool examples of it. Uh, probably the most substantial one is Israel. Um, after its War of Independence or founding in 1948, the Israeli military was largely equipped with surplus German arms and equipment. A lot of it came from Czechoslovakia, but they had Mausers, they had MG-34s, they had BF-109 uh, fighter aircraft, they had a lot of German stuff. They standardized on 8mm Mauser, uh, they had a lot of Car 98K Mausers from Germany, and when they, they did eventually buy more from FN, but they bought them in 8mm Mauser, and until they were able to set up a more robust domestic professional arms production industry, yeah, they pretty much used all surplus. Now there was some British stuff floating around as well, and then a variety of other equipment. Um, the British, of course, had been the occupying force in what was then British Palestine, and so naturally a lot of British stuff ended up in Israeli hands, but it was predominantly German. Uh, there are a couple other examples that come to mind, and those are based on uh, well, one I know of with uh, Bannerman was a huge surplus company, Francis Bannerman and Sons. Uh, operating out of upstate New York, and he was running from basically the end of the Civil War uh, into the beginning of the 1900s. And I don't know, I can't confirm a specific example, but um, I recall hearing about a couple small South American countries that basically equipped themselves, their militaries, entirely from Francis Bannerman. He certainly had the capacity to do it. He would buy huge stockpiles of surplus arms from you know, national militaries. And uh, all the equipment and accoutrements that went with them. So countries, I'm just randomly picking names here, but countries like Ecuador, um, Nicaragua, you know, small Central or South American countries in particular, were able to equip their forces with things like Remington rolling blocks uh, and other arms from Bannermans and then get with them ammunition and uh, uniform components and everything that they needed. 
uh, Century International Arms, or Inter Arms actually. Um, Inter Arms probably could have done the same thing. I don't know if they ever did though, but Sam Cummings and Inter Arms were a similar sort of setup where they just bought it, unimaginable huge amounts of surplus from countries. And they were international dealers, they were happy to sell arms to uh, other existing military powers. They're not set up just to sell on the American civilian market. Let's see, Joseph says, other than the A6 Meunier and the RSC 1917 self-loading rifles, which of the French semi-automatic prototypes do you think had the most promise given the direction firearms development would take during and after World War I? In other words, what do you think would have served France best in the interwar period and into World War II from a practical and logistical standpoint? Well, this is probably a kind of boring answer, but I think the one that they actually did develop would have been the best one. And that would be this guy, which I don't think is going to fit all the way in frame here. Um, the, so the gas system on, this is a Moss 1944, the gas system that it uses, which is a true direct impingement system, was actually first developed uh, by the French, a guy named Rossignol, in uh, 1901. And then they would eventually couple that with the rear tilting bolt uh, locking system that they have in this rifle. The, that prototype was first fielded in, I believe, either 28 or 31. They had some teething problems with it, but ultimately they had the basis, the foundation for the Moss 44 series of rifles as early as the 1930s, and had they put more of a priority on it and actually developed it and got it into production in time to use in World War II, uh, I think it would have been a very effective rifle. Uh, it was after the war, and it is more practical and more effective than the other prototype designs that the French were tinkering with. Uh, in particular, it is a very simple, very rugged, and durable gun. And that's kind of a theme in a lot of French arms development. So uh, ultimately they did not get it done in time. They had the Moss 1940 that was in going through some pretty much final trials, well in 1940, a little bit too late. Really the main substantial difference between the Moss 40 and the 44 here, the 40 still had a five round fixed magazine. Uh, after the liberation of France, specifically saint Etienne. They rushed to get this into production and then decided to update it with a detachable magazine. Uh, however, these did not, the first production didn't come out until actually the war in Europe was over. So these didn't see any combat use, but if they'd been developed in time, I think they would have been uh, the best of the French developmental rifles. Which makes sense, because if, unless something gets screwed up, the best of the prospects is the one that will eventually get adopted. All right, from Simon. Uh, what is the best concealed carry handgun with historical significance? Now, I'm assuming, Simon, that what you're getting at is what's the what's the best like CNR style of collectible, cool, obsolete, but still functional handgun to use for concealed carry? And the answer is, let's be honest, none of them. This is kind of like saying what's the what's the best antique car I can get uh, in order to have a safe vehicle on the highway? The answer is, well, some are better than others, but none of them is really going to compare to the safety standards on modern production cars. And the same thing goes with handguns. Uh, the purpose of concealed carry is to have a functional and utilitarian uh, weapon for self-defense. And carrying something deliberately that is old and has an aesthetic cool factor, I get it, but it's counterproductive to the purpose of concealed carry. So, you know, there are a lot of designs out there that will work fine uh, with and an old firearm, of course, I would strongly encourage you to have it thoroughly checked out by yourself or someone else competent to make sure that the gun is in good working order. Uh, but a lot of the older designs, you know, we've talked about here many times before that there hasn't been a whole lot of change in firearms design in the last 50 years, not fundamentally. So uh, old, older pistols made by reputable high quality companies are going to be just fine. Um, Brownings, Colts, Mausers, FNs, you know, if if you are dead set on carrying a gun that is uh, a historical, historically interesting over uh, modern, effective, reliable, and durable, well, then take your pick of whatever one looks coolest and feels best and has the most historical significance to you. Ooh, here's another one where I'm going to have a disappointing answer, I think, uh, from Christopher. Are there any so-called obsolete caliber rounds that you think would still be viable or potentially even better than today's popular offerings? And again, I'm going to say, well, not really. Um, 
The older cartridges that are still viable are typically still available. Uh, 4570, for example, is a quite adequate, quite effective, useful cartridge, and you can still get it today. Um, and they still make firearms chambered for it today. The stuff that is obsolete and no longer produced typically is no longer produced because something better took its place, and that better cartridge is still going to be around. So, for example, 44 Russian. I know you can still get 44 Russian because of cowboy action shooting, basically, but uh, there's no particularly good reason for anyone to start producing 44 Russian today, because we have plenty of other cartridges that thoroughly overlap uh, its, its role, um, and there's no need for a 44 Russian today. Uh, and I think that pretty much goes for virtually everything out there, even if you want to look at you know, early assault rifle cartridges or potential ones like the 276 Pedersen or the, the 280 British. Well, it, the stuff that's available today can pretty much take the place of any of those. We have so many cartridges that are so finely, so closely specialized into specific roles that I think with the, the stuff that's available today, you can really, you'll get two or three uh, potential candidates for pretty much any use you can come up with for a cartridge and you don't need to go back there's no benefit to going back to older cartridges that have fallen by the wayside. Uh, Shane has two questions here. Uh, first one is, you mentioned in one of your previous Pedersen device firing videos that it is uh, very complicated and not likely to ever be reproduced. Can you explain why that is? And do you ever plan on doing a disassembly video if given the chance on one? I'm fascinated by the Pedersen device and would love to know more about them as the literature never shows disassembly. Uh, yes, at some point I would like to do a disassembly video on one and show you that in detail. The reason that it is complicated is that it has to be designed to have adjustable headspace. So the way these were made is they made a whole pile of uh, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of Pedersen devices and those would be issued to soldiers who already had rifles. So there was no effective way to actually mate the Pedersen device and its matched rifle at the factory to do, to properly set headspace. So instead, the device had to be designed with adjustable headspace built in. And that's what makes it a complicated uh, thing to get into. That and it wasn't really meant to be disassembled in the field, so it's got a lot of small parts and tight springs and uh, to be honest, I have yet to actually take one apart myself, so at some point I will. Now, as for why it, I don't think it will be reproduced, that's largely not the device itself, but finding rifles to put it into. So the issue is in order to effectively, to economically reproduce something like that, you have to be able to make and sell a substantial number of them. If you want to make a reproduction and make 10 of them, they're going to cost $10,000 a piece. That's just how manufacturing works, at least until we have super cool future technology additive manufacturing really up and running well. Uh, however, if you want to make them affordable to the point that you can actually like make a profit doing it, instead of being that machinist who made 10 Pedersen devices because he just really loved the Pedersen device, uh, then you have to make them accessible to a lot of people. And the Pedersen device is specifically designed for a 30 caliber Springfield barrel. And we don't have a good cartridge that fits that, which is, that's the reason that they had to design a brand new cartridge for the Pedersen device in the first place. It uses the, uh, the was it the 30 caliber 1918 cartridge, which is uh, 762 by 20, I believe, or I think it's 20 millimeters. Um, it's basically a straight wall 30 caliber cartridge, and there's n and it's gone, by the way. It, the Pedersen device used it. The French basically copied it for their 1935 pistols and their 1938 submachine gun, and then nobody else ever used it afterwards. So that cartridge hasn't been made since probably World War II. There's, there's some surplus ammo available, but it's all collectible. There's no bulk ammo. If you were going to try and sell these things for people to actually use, you don't have a good source of ammunition for them. And there's no good substitute cartridge either. Uh, we have, first off, you're going to be limited to a 30 caliber bore. Uh, certainly if you want it to be historically authentic and fit in a Springfield rifle, you're not going to be able to effectively do that and require people to rechamber their, you know, rebarrel their rifles for some new uh, bullet diameter like 9mm, which would, it, if there was an original Pedersen in with a 9mm bore diameter, you'd be set because there'd be lots of options, but there aren't in 30 caliber. Uh, 32 is not 30 caliber. Um, 
762 Tokarev, which is really the, the biggest, most common 30 caliber pistol cartridge, is a bottlenecked case. And the whole purpose, the, the way that the Pedersen device worked was it had a like proboscis uh, chamber plug at the, at the front that would fit into the 30 uh, 6 chamber. And, you, and, and with a straight wall 30 caliber cartridge, they were able to fit it into the profile of a 30 6 cartridge because it gets a little wider. The problem is with a 7.62 Tokarev, you can't fit that into a chamber insert um, in the same way without having a huge amount of free bore in a way that wouldn't really work effectively. So uh, you can't use 32, you can't use any of the revolver cartridges, you can't use anything that's a 9mm bore like 380 or 9 Makarov. You can't use, you know, shoot, you can't use 8mm Nambu. I mean, now we're really getting into cartridges that are hard to find. Um, should anyone ever actually start producing 765 French long, um, 765 by 20, that would actually open up the door if someone really wanted to do the project, because that cartridge is basically identical to 30 Pedersen. So maybe, um, and I'd love to get someone to start doing that myself, but maybe if someone develop, someone actually puts that cartridge into production, then you'd have a caliber option, and then someone could actually look at the mechanical elements involved in making a reproduction Pedersen device. So, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention, in order to function, uh, the the number the uh, 1903 A1 Springfields that were set up to use the Pedersen device had a modified set of fire control parts, and those parts were removed and replaced with standard 1903 parts when the guns were taken out of service. So you can still find 1903 A1 rifles that have a, a cutout for an ejection port in the side of the receiver. However, you cannot just drop a Pedersen device into those. You have to also replace the fire control parts, which means finding uh, reproduction fire control parts as well. So that's why I don't think they'll get reproduced anytime soon. All right, Shane's second question is, are you uh, interested in taking viewer submissions of personally owned forgotten weapons? For example, uh, I mail firearms to your FFL and you mail it back to me when you're finished filming. Um, occasionally, yes. I used to do this a little bit more often than I do now. Um, I have a lot of people offer this and I very much appreciate those offers. The issue I have at the moment is with my travel schedule, I just can't really coordinate borrowing, filming, and returning guns in an effective time frame. Um, so occasionally someone has offered me a gun that is really weird or hard to find, and I will do my best to take people up on those offers. But for guns, anything that I can re expect to find with any sort of degree of certainty anywhere else is just not effective for me to borrow yours, uh, film it, and then send it back to you. So like I said, I really do appreciate the offers. Uh, it's very generous of people, and I really like that people are willing to trust me with their guns. But uh, it's just not practical for me most of the time. Christopher says, what was the best bolt action military rifle ever fielded by an army? I think I've actually talked about this once or twice before. Uh, the answer to me is the model of 1917 Enfield. Uh, it is durable. It's extremely durable. It's a rugged rifle. It's an accurate rifle. Uh, it is chambered for a good cartridge, 30-06, actually holds six rounds, feeds with stripper clips that work very nicely. It has a cock on closing bolt throw that is smooth and fast, and it has a great set of aperture style sights. I think it was the, uh, I am willing to go out and say that that is in fact the best bolt action military rifle ever fielded. Uh, better sights than the Mauser, uh, well, better sights than almost everything actually. Better bolt throw than some of the, like the number four Enfield um, has a fast bolt throw, it has good aperture sights, but it is not as reliable and durable as the 1917 Enfield. Uh, the fact that the U.S. didn't end up adopting the Enfield after World War I uh, really speaks to a uh, skewed set of priorities when they made that decision in the 1920s. William says, the Lewis gun seemed like a pretty revolutionary development in light machine guns. Why didn't the forced airflow barrel shroud concept catch on? I imagine a ver version with swappable barrels would be very possible. Well, I think the whole point of that forced airflow design was to not need a swappable barrel. The What ultimately prevented anyone else from really adopting that concept, and before anyone says it, I know the Russians have a version of the PK now with a fixed barrel and a forced air shroud like that. But they are the only people that I'm aware of who have ever copied that, that style or that type of device from the Lewis gun. I think the problem was you could get a better result for less weight 
by making a simple, just a detachable barrel. I don't know how effective that forced air concept really actually was um, above having just a barrel with some cooling fins or a barrel with a lot of mass. And you added a lot of bulk to the gun, and you actually add a substantial amount of weight to the gun by having that cooling system. You have to have this really quite large aluminum radiator on the barrel, and then you also have to have that steel shroud over the barrel. All that stuff adds a lot of weight and bulk, and, and it really kind of prevents you from having a quick change barrel. It certainly would be much more complicated to have a quick change barrel with that system on the gun. So when people started looking at it, they realized, you know what, we can make the gun lighter and smaller and handier by just having the barrel come off and then someone else can carry a spare barrel if necessary, uh, or the gunner can carry the spare barrel but he can carry it in a pack instead of having it hanging off the front of the gun all the time. Next up is from Ted, who says, What, if any, advantages do you think someone with a Spencer carbine would have over a Henry? This is going to be a quick and easy question, because the answer is none. Um, the Spencer, I think, is the only thing that the Spencer has going over the Henry is ballistic power, and not by a whole lot. Um, the Spencer is a substantially heavier bullet. It's a 300, or, or I think actually a 350 grain bullet, um, traveling a little bit faster uh, than the Henry, but not very much. The Spencer is slower, more fragile, less reliable, lower capacity. Uh, and did I mention slower? The Spencer is actually substantially slower and more awkward to operate than the Henry. So given the choice, I would definitely take a Henry for anything other than just wanting to be a cool guy running around with a Spencer. Next up from Eki, E-K-I. Uh, <laughs> I think he's asked this before. Uh, I'll restate what I asked before. The differences and advantages between pull-through and push-through belts on machine guns, as well as cloth and metal belt links. Uh, so, for the purposes of the gun, a push-through belt is definitely a simpler system. For purposes of the belt, a pull-through system or a pull-out system is better. The question here is, when, when the gun is feeding a cartridge from the belt into the chamber, can it simply push it forward through the belt into the chamber, or does it have to grab it, extract it backwards, then move it out of line with the belt, and then push it into the chamber? And typically, well certainly anything using a cloth belt has to be a pull-out system, because in order to have a push-through uh, belt, you have to have some, you have to have an opening in the belt loop. Whatever, you know, that, that loop that's holding the cartridge has to have an opening in it where the bolt can contact the cartridge and push all the way through. So that restricts push-through belts to only being metallic belt designs, and it does also add some restrictions typically on rimmed cartridges. If you've got a cartridge with especially a large taper and then a big prominent rim at the back, it's going to be a lot harder to shove that thing through a belt link. Not impossible. Um, the Czech Model 59 machine gun is in 762 by 54 rimmed and uses a push-through belt. Uh, it's a spring steel belt that just flexes open enough to let that cartridge through. But it's about the only example I can come up with. Um, all the others are going to be 8mm Mauser, 308, uh, rimless cartridges. Now in order to have a pull-out system, you need to have some mechanical element that can grab a cartridge and then pull it backwards. So you're kind of looking at two sets of extractors. You have to have an extractor to extract the round from the belt, and then a second one to extract the fired case from the chamber after firing. On the Maxim gun, this is done by having an extractor that lifts up onto, from below, onto the cartridge rim and then pulls it backwards. On the PK style or the RP46, uh, the, the Russian designs have these pair of extractor fingers or tongs that are made, they're heat treated such that they will actually open up and snap around a rim and then pull it backwards. That's another option. Either of these systems are going to be more complex than one that just requires you to shove the, the cartridge through. However, your belt design is more difficult or more limiting when you have a push-through design. So I think that pretty much explains why both systems are out there. Some designers are more interested in the elements applying to the gun, some are more interested in the elements applying to the belt. Uh, Nicholas says, being rather famous, I, okay, um, given the amount of travel you do, how often do people recognize you in airports and the like? Are you mostly able to go about life as usual, or are you frequently interrupted? Any entertaining anecdotes, or has something like that ever led to more opportunities? 
Um, not to emphasize my own celebrity or lack thereof, uh, I do absolutely get recognized pretty much any time I go someplace gun related. So if I'm in a museum, less so in museums, if I'm in a gun show or a gun store, the chances are pretty darn good that someone's going to recognize me in there uh, and, and introduce themselves or say hi. The vast majority of those people are cool. Um, it's always fun meeting fans. And I have yet to have anyone who has been like super creepy stalker sort of guy. Um, it does also occasionally happen at non-gun related things. I've had people at gas stations, grocery stores, just random places that I happen to be as a part of living a normal life, um, who do in fact recognize me and say something. And again, the vast majority of those people have been pretty cool. Um, the, the weirdest anecdote I can give you, which I think is totally strange, but really cool, was um, earlier this year I was doing some filming in France, and I took a day to go to the Musée d'Armée in Paris, the Paris Army Museum. And it was, I didn't announce it, I didn't publish it anywhere, it was largely just for me to, did I? Actually I might have said something, but um, it was basically for me to explore the museum myself. Um, I didn't have any contacts in the back, back rooms or anything, I was just looking at the exhibits. So I was in the museum all day, and I ran into a number of people, four or five people, uh, who recognized me. And the most interesting one was I was, I had met one guy and we were talking and something I've noticed is that people are much more likely to recognize me if I'm speaking because they recognize the voice more than uh, anything visual. Anyway, I was talking to this kid, cool guy, we were looking at some of the exhibits and another guy I noticed, he like looked at me and then kind of did this double take was, which I've seen before, uh, I go, okay, this this guy probably recognizes me. And it turned out he was a South African guy who was also on vacation in Paris at the time. And a month earlier, um, he had arranged to send me a copy of the book on South African firearms that has been fairly recently published. I did a book review on it. Uh, great book, by the way, it's a fantastic resource. But the guy who had been emailing me back and forth and arranged to send the book, I recognized me in a museum in France, completely uncoordinated. I didn't tell him I was going to be there. He didn't tell me we were going to, he was going to be there. And uh, that was a crazy chance meeting. So that's the best anecdote I think that I have. All right, next question is from Leonard, says, military rifle sights. What drove the differences in open sights? We see apertures, U-notches, V-notches, barley corn front sights, narrow posts, wide posts, sight hoods, sight wings, etc. Uh, were sight types specified in military specifications offered up by manufacturers, or were there other factors at work? Well, I would say all of those things are true uh, in some cases. Uh, in general, what you have with different styles of sights is that they're good for different things. Um, for example, and a classic example for me to call up here, is French World War I sights. They started off with a narrow front post uh, and a narrow rear aperture, and that made for pretty good, accurate, precision shooting. But those are sights that are slow to line up, uh, and they limit your visibility a little bit, and uh, in low light conditions they can be hard to use. So later in the war, 1915 or so, um, the French adapted a new style of sight with an extremely wide front post. That was not so good for precision shooting, but they determined at that point that precision shooting wasn't really what anyone needed to do. And instead, that very large front post was a much better, a much quicker sight to acquire, it was better in low light, uh, and those qualities made it preferable. So they changed. Um, the 1903, the American 1903 rear sight has a little aperture on it that is kind of useless for anything practical, but it makes great uh, a great sight on the like the 600 yard known distance qualification range. And that may have had a large part in why it was adopted. Um, where these sites originally come from is usually the manufacturers. Um, when companies submit guns for military testing, they will put on whatever style of sites that they think are best, uh, and the military may request changes or may accept those sites as they're set up. Um, there may be times when the military specifies a type of site that they're looking for, but sometimes not. Um, things like V-notches versus U-notches are often personal preference of some of the people involved in the project. I would say that a U-notch and a square post is a better situation than a barley corn front sight and a V-notch, but again there are pros and cons to both. Uh, some are a little faster, some are more precise. 
uh, how much space you have on the side of the site, uh, you know, how much light gap between the front and the sides of the rear sight is a question of personal preference in many cases. And so that's why you'll see different countries and different militaries at different times adopting different styles. Molly says, prior to World War II, milling solid blocks of material was the primary method of making firearms, but during and after the war there was a major push towards metal stampings to reduce costs. Is metal stamped construction still relevant for low-cost firearms manufactured today, or has it been supplanted by polymer and metal casting construction? That's a really good question. And when I started to think about it I realized that, yeah, actually I think polymer has pretty much replaced stamped uh, sheet metal for all of the things that stamped sheet metal was really good at and intended for. Um, stamped sheet metal is one of those things where it's not great for prototyping because you have to put in the machining expense to make a set of dies, but once you've got that die you can stamp out a lot of guns very cost effectively. Uh, stamped sheet metal allows you to use lower grades of steel. If you're milling something out you generally have to have a fairly high quality steel if this is a receiver or some other you know, large load bearing component. The way stamped metal works you really don't need high quality materials to use, and again polymer kind of takes that over. Um, it costs a, a large amount up front to make a polymer, a die uh, for polymer, or a mold rather for polymers. Once you've got that mold though it becomes very cheap to make uh, copies of the gun. So just like stamping you've got low cost volume production. Uh, polymer doesn't require any really strong components the way that steels do, there's no heat treating really involved in, in polymer. So yeah, and if you look at it you don't see a whole lot of stamped steel guns out there anymore. What's What people were making were largely, like in the 1980s you have guns like the Uzis and the Max, uh, where you have a stamp, a simple stamped receiver in order to make a low cost gun. And yeah, that's been pretty much all replaced by polymer. Good question. Let's see, Ben says, I noticed on the MP35 and MG17 videos that the thumbnails featured an uncensored swastika as the German flag, where previous videos on German firearms from the era would feature a blurred swastika. What has changed? Uh, initially, well, initially when I started using thumbnails with national flags in them I thought it was a really cool idea, which I still do, I really like that system, and I did not consider uh, a number of potentially offensive and controversial flags. Now I lucked out that the Confederate flag, the actual American Confederate flag that was the national flag of that government, is not the flag that everyone associates with the Confederacy. So I can get away with that one easily because people don't recognize the true Confederate flag as something controversial. Uh, the swastika however is a different situation. Now there are two things going on. Um, one is YouTube's monetization policy. My initial experiments, remember that YouTube does not tell anyone, including people making videos like me, what exactly their policies or criterias are. Uh, they have some vague guidelines that are set out in the FAQs, and beyond that it's up to, they have some algorithm that is basically a black box that determines if your video is suitable for advertising. My initial experiments had led me to believe that having a swastika in the thumbnail uh, would pretty much immediately render that video not monetizable, and that's why I started using a blurred out flag instead. By the way, I spent some time trying to come up with the best uh, the best alternative to having a proper true Nazi flag in the thumbnail image, because uh, man, that, that image attracts assholes like flypaper. Um, I recognize that it's the true flag, uh, it's the historically correct flag for 1935 to 1945 Germany, but I always have a lot of curation of comments that has to be done on a video that is from the Nazi German period because of the number of either edgy kids or true neo-Nazis who show up and start making nasty comments. Uh, with that in mind I tried to come up with a good alternative, um, and I can't really come up with one. People have suggested using what is basically the Nazi flag but with an iron cross in the middle instead of a swastika. I would rather have something that is either historically correct or something that is obviously not correct, um, obviously has been changed. Uh, I don't want to use a flag that's just a substitute like they typically do in video games with the Iron Cross. So what I ended up with was the, the Kriegsmarine banner uh, that did have a swastika in the middle and I just blur that out, and it's obvious that something has been changed, but it is also, a, a, before it's been blurred, it is a period correct flag. Now 
where this leads to is more recently I came to have for other reasons I started realizing that maybe the swastika wasn't the a, a major element in YouTube's uh, criteria. So I did an experiment. The first the, the first two in that experiment were the MG17 and the MP35, and it appeared that those the the thumbnail image did not actually cause the video to be to be demonetized. And so at that point, in the interests of having the, the historically correct flag, uh, I did start using it. However, uh, I, after a short period of time, I actually had a legal uh, challenge assessed on the MG17 video because that flag is illegal to display in Germany with certain limited uh, exceptions for educational use. And someone reported that video, and YouTube followed through on its policy to follow German law. And by the way, that law is not some newfangled social justice warrior stuff. That law goes back to, I believe, 1952 and is part of Germany's. Uh, general efforts to prevent glorification or re-emergence of Nazi ideology. And I don't disagree with their goals. Uh, that tactic that they use of prohibiting public display of the symbol is not something we would do here in the United States, uh, basically because of the First Amendment. But Germany is an independent sovereign country, and they, are, they have the opportunity to make whatever laws they feel are most suitable and appropriate. And if you don't like it, well, you're welcome to get a time machine and go back to 1952 Germany and argue it with them. Um, however, what there there are arguments to be made over what's the best flag to use in a situation where it's going to be offensive to a lot of people. Honestly, offensive either way. I get comments from people who are offended that the swastika is there, and I get comments from people who are deeply offended that I'm censoring and trying to destroy history, apparently, by having a blurred flag. Um, that, that question is far less relevant than the question of are the videos actually going to be available, legally available to watch in places like Germany. The thumbnail is such a minor part of the video that the reason that I'm doing things is to convey information on the history and development and operation of the firearm. And the thumbnail is just a side issue. So if the thumbnail is going to contain material that gets the video literally prohibited in not just Germany, but actually a large chunk of Europe, um, then I'm not going to use that symbol in the thumbnail, because it's counterproductive to the whole purpose of forgotten weapons. So that is why you saw the swastika come back for a couple of videos, it was an experiment, uh, and then having gotten a legal takedown or legal block on one of those videos, I went back, I left that one alone, the MG17, because it's already blocked and nothing's going to change that. Uh, but the other videos that had gone up with a swastika thumbnail uh, got changed back to the blurred flag. The blurred flag is what you will see in the future because primarily of Germany's law on display of the swastika as a symbol. Now yes, there it is uh, possible to have exceptions made for educational and historical material, and in theory what I'm doing should qualify completely for those exceptions. However, in, in a real world sense, what we're dealing with here is YouTube's automated mechanical filtering and, and legal system, and there is no practical effective way for me to try and fight that. And honestly, I'm not that interested in fighting it. It's not that big a deal what flag is represented in the thumbnail of the video. The thumbnail's not the main point here. Unfortunately, it is the first thing that people see, and so it's what a lot of people are making a big fuss about in comment sections. So. I am generally not particularly interested in having ongoing raging arguments over this in the comments of videos where the thumbnail is not supposed to be the point in the first place, so I generally curate away all of those comments, which is why you may not see them. Uh, if I do my job correctly, you don't see arguments about the flag and the thumbnail in the videos. So that's a bit long-winded, uh, it's not something I discuss a lot because I kind of just it's not the point of the video. I'm not trying to make political statements. I'm deliberately trying to stay away from political statements. And the system that I chose for thumbnails without thinking about Nazis and other similar uh, you know, evil regimes, uh, that kind of led me inadvertently into this controversial situation. So what I prefer to do is pick a, situ pick a solution and then let's get on with life and talk about the actual guns instead of just a thumbnail image. All right, that is definitely as long as I need to talk about that question. So let us move on to Carson, who says, what kind of kit do you travel with? Mainly the audio-visual side of things as you've described tools before. 
a screwdriver and a punch set that go with me most places. Uh, well, obviously I am currently filming myself on my kit. So uh, before I started this Q&A, I did a little bit of uh, video on an iPhone. Occasionally I will do my filming actually just like I'm doing right here and now, uh, which is using an iPhone 7. But that's typically uh, either when I am uh, somewhere where I didn't anticipate doing a lot of filming, or if someone has asked me to show all my camera gear and thus I can't use it to show it. So uh, everything else that I use though is pretty much laid out here, and I don't use it all all the time. So let's start by taking a look at this middle Pelican case. This is my high-speed camera. It's a, uh, an SC1 Edgertronic. I've had it for a bunch of years now. It works really well, I think. Uh, it will technically do up to 18,000 frames per second, but uh, the, the higher the frame rate, the lower the picture quality, and I typically use it at between 1,500 and maybe 2,500 frames per second. And that gives a pretty decent quality, and you really don't need to be any faster than that to get a good view on firearms. Unfortunately, this will not do an adequate job of capturing uh, bullets in flight, so I don't really even try anymore because I just know it's not up to it. Anyway, uh, camera. It has two potential power sources, uh, 120 volt AC, you do have to plug this thing in, and uh, 12 volt cigarette lighter style. I've got this cord all bundled up in a wad there. Uh, it uses standard Nikon camera lenses, which is nice. For power, what I typically use when I'm at home or, or within car travel of wherever I'm shooting, uh, is just a cheapo small car jump box because I have right there the uh, cigarette lighter style of plug, and this thing can easily do several days of, of power for the, the camera. The jump starting a car is way more intensive than running an Edgertronic camera. The other thing here is this little tiny mini router, which I Velcro onto the side of the camera, and that allows me to control the camera through my smartphone. So. Uh, that's a lot more, a lot handier than actually having to wire the thing in, uh, although I do still carry the um, Ethernet cable with it, so I can hardwire the camera to a laptop computer to control it if I need to. Anyway, uh, if I'm going someplace like, well, typically the Rock Island Auction House, where I know that I'm not going to be doing any actual uh, firing of guns, I leave the high-speed camera at home because it's just an extra liability and expense to carry. What I actually use for pretty much everything are these two sets. This is just a, uh, a nice, it's a, a decent folding tripod, nothing particularly fancy. And then this is just a case that I found at a thrift store filled with foam and then cut out to fit all of the various junk that I want to keep in it. Uh, this is a Canon XA20 camera. I have my lavalier mic here, which just sits on top. And then the rest of this stuff is, well, there's an assortment here. I always carry with me this Rode just boom mic uh, as a, a backup. I much prefer to use the wireless mic here. It's a Sennheiser. It's pretty darn good. It was expensive, but I think it's worth it. So that's the transmitter that I wear in a pocket. And then that is the receiver unit that plugs into, see the three pins there plugs into the camera. Uh, got some spare batteries. I have battery charger, SD card reader. This is a little clip to mount an iPhone to my camera tripod. So if I'm in a position where like the camera fails and I need to use the iPhone as a backup, I have that mount. This is Velcroed into there. This is an adapter to allow me to use this nice audio on the iPhone, which I don't think I've ever actually done in a video yet. But again, it's there as a backup in case anything goes wrong. And that's pretty much it. Some other miscellaneous cables for uh, for charging things mostly. So there's the camera itself. Nothing very fancy looking. Uh, I really like to travel light. In my experience, having just basically just this thing uh, makes it a lot easier to get into places. It makes it much more convenient to actually do filming. Um, yeah. And it's... It's what's allowed me to travel as much as I do. I don't have to try and drag around a whole bunch of lighting equipment or, you know, extra people to hold boom mics and run cameras. And this is all a one-man operation, and that's how it works.
I guess I should mention these two. I bring the power strip with me because I have a couple of different chargers and I'm usually running a laptop as well. So that allows me to just plug everything into one convenient wall socket. And if I'm not in the United States or Canada, I have that way just one power adapter that I need. So I can plug my power strip into the adapter, the adapter into one wall socket pretty much anywhere in the world and charge batteries, run my laptop, etc. All right, next up from David says, Dear Ian, I've always wondered how burst fire weapons worked exactly. I recall that burst fire was invented so new recruits wouldn't dump the whole magazine into one enemy. Is there any truth to this urban legend? And further, how do these weapons determine how many rounds are being fired with one trigger pull? Can it be easily changed, uh, e.g. converting from three round to five round burst? Uh, greetings from Linz, the town where the C96 broom handle I did a video on was made. Well, that's cool. Uh, well, David, uh, actually, I have recently posted a video on the Brita PG, which is one of the very first guns made with a burst fire mechanism. And in that video, I pulled apart the trigger mechanism and demonstrated how exactly that burst mechanism worked. And that one's pretty typical in that they generally work with a cam. So you'll have a rotating wheel with some, some cog teeth on it. And what it does is on the, the, the third cog that gets hit, trips a disconnector and uh, forces it to lock the bolt in position so the shooter has to pull the trigger again to actually fire again. Um, that's typically how they work. Some are better than others. There are some where the cog is a very simple system and if you pull the trigger quickly and release it you can fire one or two rounds but not the whole burst. Usually they're three round burst. Um, and in those cases the second time you pull the trigger the cog wheel will rotate only the one or two positions left before actuating and stopping the burst. So there are some where they'll have what's called memory. Excuse me. So you'll fire a one-shot burst with a quick flick of the trigger, and then the next time you try and fire a burst it may technically be a three-round mechanism, but it will only fire two because you fired the first round of the burst previously. Um, some systems don't have memory like that. Some will always give you a three round burst or however many they're set up for. Um, I'm not aware of any that are easily interchangeable for different numbers. Typically that's something that's decided in the initial design of the gun and then left that way and it's almost always three rounds. That's kind of the standard. Uh, less than three rounds. There are some two round burst guns by the way. Um, the Soviet AN-94 in addition to having its full auto, full auto setting has a two round burst mechanism, uh, but usually it's three. Because usually people decide that once you hit round number four, you're probably not uh, firing effectively any longer. Um, and if you were, you wouldn't need the burst setting. If your fourth round is going to be controllable, then you have the training and practice and experience that you don't need a burst setting. Which leads me to your urban legend, which is, as far as I know, actually true. Um, the reason for burst settings is so that you don't have to try and train good really good burst trigger control into troops who may not be particularly experienced, who may not have a long term of service. Uh, you know, if you have a military that has mandatory conscription and everybody's going to serve a six month or a 12 month term of service, that's really not enough time to have enough round count to get people experienced enough to effectively fire full auto. So a three round burst limiting mechanism on the guns is an idea for a stand in um, so that people don't in fact get uh, stressed out and dump full magazines when they shouldn't be. All right, next question is from Zach, who says, what would you consider some must-have books for a firearms enthusiast? And is there any hope of ever seeing a Forgotten Weapons DVD set? Well, I'll start with the DVDs. Uh, the answer to that is almost certainly no. And the reason is that a DVD is capable of carrying something like three hours of footage, and I have many, many, many times that much. I have over a thousand videos currently posted. Um, average length is probably 10 minutes. That's 10,000 minutes. That's going to be a whole lot of DVDs, uh, more than would ever be practical. So no, I don't think I will ever actually have a DVD set. Um, as for must-have books, that's also a tricky question because it, it really comes down to what are you interested in. If you're looking for a book that covers everything, you know, general information on firearms, well, there are a bunch out there. Um, however, there's also the internet. And if you are going to go buy, you know, the, the general book of all guns, if that's something you can actually pick up, you know, it's going to be like this thick, it's probably going to have about the same depth of information as something like Wikipedia. Um, 
there's the, the one really good example, the one really good exception actually to that rule, um, this book called Handguns of the World by Edward Ezell, which I think does a really good job of being an introductory book about mechanics and history and development and cover a lot of both common and very unusual firearms. It does focus specifically on handguns, and primarily military handguns. But when people ask for like, what's one good introductory book, that's usually the one I recommend. Beyond that, if you want to get more information than you could get off of Wikipedia, you need to really focus, narrowly focus on some specific subject. So, you know, it, there, yes, there are some good books on Lee Enfields, there are good books on Mausers, there are books on Mauser pistols and Colt pistols and military arms of Argentina. But I wouldn't call any of those must-have books for all collectors, because it really you may not be interested in Argentina, or you may not be interested in Colt. Um, you really have to specify what kind of books are you looking for, and then it's a question of if it's a narrow enough subject, usually whatever is available is going to be pretty good. Um, but. Uh, next up from Alvin, from Alvin York apparently, I don't think it's the same Alvin York. Anyway, uh, what are the advantages to carrying and using rifle grenades over a bazooka? I've read that some American units in World War II preferred to use anti-tank rifle grenades over the bazooka because they were considered just as effective against German armor as the bazooka. If that's true, why even issue bazookas? Uh, that's actually a pretty simple question. Uh, it is a bazooka is heavy and bulky and awkward and a pain in the butt to carry around, but it is much more accurate. Uh, bazookas are generally going to, or rocket launchers, are almost always going to be direct fire. They have a nice set of uh, very purpose-built sights in them. Um, and you'll typically have a longer range, because you can have a rocket motor in the thing that's going to propel the shell and it'll do its job, do it very well. However, a rifle grenade allows you to have largely the same sort of terminal performance, because as armor piercing, at least as far as armor piercing shells, these things are all working on the principle of um, hollow charges, which don't require a lot of velocity, uh, just the, the physical geometry of a hollow shaped charge. And you can get that in something the size of a rifle grade with rifle grenade without any problem. However, the rifle grenade is limited by the mechanical capacity of the gun uh, to absorb pressure and recoil, and typically you're going to have a shorter effective range. You're also going to be a bit less accurate because the grenade launching sights on rifles are kind of an oversight, and they're also often going to be sort of indirect fire. If you've got a heavy grenade that's going to have a substantial range, it's not something that can be effectively fired from the shoulder. You have to mount the rifle on the ground, then make sure that you've got it at the right angle to work with whatever your sights are. Um, however, the rifle grenades are far more portable. So um, I'm going to keep bringing up the French here, but the French really took a liking to rifle grenades because it, for them it was a way to allow every infantryman to have an anti-armor capability, or an indirect fire capability as well without needing to have specialist units in the right place at the right time uh, to defend infantry against tanks or emplacements. So um, the Russians of course took the opposite approach and went with RPGs for this sort of work, uh, which are they're more portable than a bazooka, I think, but those are your two trade-offs. You can have the basically the more effective, uh, I don't want to say more effective because for armor the range is really independent of the effectiveness. We're used to thinking of rifles where they have a lot of power up close and the far, the longer the distance the more the projectile has slowed down and the less effective it is at something like barrier penetration. With a shaped charge you know you could stick the thing on the side of the tank with some velcro and it would be just literally equally effective as if you were shooting it at 3,000 feet per second because it's the geometry of the explosion that does the work. Um, but as far as accuracy and range go, with a, a designated rocket launching device like a bazooka, you get uh, a longer range, more accurate weapon, whereas with rifle grenades you get something that's more portable and more easily distributed amongst a lot of troops. Let's see. Glenn says, what is one of your favorite World War II rifles that most people do not know about? Um, Everyone knows about the rifles of major powers. Is there are there any rifles from a minor power that are worth noting? Well, most of the time the minor powers didn't have the production capacity to build their own distinctive gun. So usually the minor powers are using something they bought from one of the major powers or a neutral country. Um, the one that I still really 
kind of want to get, but for no particularly good reason, is the Hungarian 35M. It is basically a split bridge monliker rifle chambered for 8x56 using the same five round end block clips that the Steyr M95 straight pull rifle uses. Um, I can't articulate any good reason why I want one of those, or any practical reason. I want one because Hungary is interesting, and that cartridge is a little bit unique and interesting, and kind of like to have one of those rifles. Um, Hungary did later at, um, adopt it, a different version, the 43M in 8mm Mauser, and they also made them for the Germans in 8 Mauser as the Gewehr 98-40. And the 9840s and the 43Ms are out there, but the one I'd really kind of like actually is the 35M in that 8x56 horrible rimmed case that's really unpleasant to shoot, but for some reason that's the one I want. Uh, let's see, moving on. Let's see, Jacob uh, has asked this question a couple times before, and I was unable to come up with good answers, so I did a little bit more looking um, this time. Jacob says, after World War II, the US submachine guns were surplused somehow. Were they all chopped up into parts kits, or were some Thompsons and Grease guns sold as full auto weapons? I assume they didn't go through the CMP, but how did an M3 arrive on the NFA today if it was never sold as a commercial firearm? Well, uh, the first thing is, the, the initial premise is not true. Uh, the US did not surplus submachine guns after World War II. In fact, virtually all of them remained in US inventory uh, in storage after World War II. They were brought out and they were used extensively in the Korean War. And here we're talking about M3 grease guns and Thompsons. Um, Thompson submachine guns, M1s and M1A1s. Uh, they were, they continued to be used in Vietnam. Now, they were not surplused, but a lot of them were given as military aid to other countries like Taiwan and South uh, Vietnam. So that's where a lot of the US stocks went, is military aid to other countries. Now at that point it becomes theoretically possible for those other countries to decide to sell small numbers or large numbers of them, and as long as it's, well depending on the date and the legalities, it is then possible for American machine gun dealers to buy them from other countries, bring them into the US and sell them either as parts kits or as registered guns. Uh, and that's how a lot of them came into, that's how a lot of the parts kits ended up on the market. It wasn't the US surplusing them, it was the US giving them to other countries who then later got rid of them. But that hasn't happened in very large numbers, because especially with the grease guns, most of the countries that we gave those things to are probably still using them. Uh, in fact, the US would go on to use the M3 grease gun into, well they were still in use in Desert Storm, um, in limited you know, applications, but they were vehicles for tank crewmen. Um, at even up to that point. So the US really didn't surplus them. Now the other place where they did come onto the market was through the 1968 amnesty. You would have had GIs who, in a legal sense, stole their guns, but threw guns in their duffel bags and brought them home from World War II at the end of the war. Those guns could have been, well, probably couldn't have been legally registered because they would have been US government property. Um, some people probably did register them and get them passed, because there wasn't necessarily a lot of communication or coordination of that sort of thing. However, the 1968 machine gun amnesty was a complete amnesty. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm aware of at least one case where someone literally stole an M16A1 from a military depot, and then amnesty registered it, and that amnesty covered not just illegal possession of a machine gun that was unregistered, that amnesty also covered anything else associated, like the fact that you stole it from an army depot in the first place. So. Guns that came back from World War II and were registered in the 1968 amnesty became completely legal after because of that amnesty, and that's how a lot of a lot more, um, especially grease guns, came onto got into the NFA and now on the uh, the market in the U.S. Jack says, "Hi Ian, I love the video on the French 8mm Lebel cartridge. Do you plan to do any more videos on cartridges? As a cartridge collector and big fan of Forgotten Weapons, it was great to see. There don't, doesn't seem to be a lot of content about cartridges on YouTube. No, there is not. Um, it's a pretty niche subject, and it's also a subject that requires a lot of very specific information. And if you if you want to do a video with uh, correct props, you know, having the actual elements." there aren't a lot of cartridge collectors out there who have a good selection. Um, you will notice in mine I didn't have good examples of any of the early 8mm Lavelle cartridges. Uh, I would like to do more of those videos in the future. They're not a huge priority because, well, I'll be honest, a lot of people aren't really interested in cartridges, and 
I myself am really much more interested in the firearms than the cartridges. The 8 Labelle was an, an interesting exception to me where there were, seri there were a lot of elements of the cartridge that had direct impacts on the firearms design. So now maybe there's a lot more of that happening in general that I am not noticing, but as I am able to I will do more cartridge videos in the future, but probably won't be doing a lot of them. Sen says, in an older video you covered the Owen submachine gun, an Australian manufactured firearm used in World War II. Other than that, and the Austen, were there any other small arms art, uh, that Australia manufactured and used during the war or afterwards, say Korea or Vietnam? Uh, really the only other one that really jumps to mind is the F1 submachine gun, which was the replacement for the Owen. Uh, it's another uh, top mounted magazine submachine gun in 9mm, looks a lot like a Sterling, uh, and that was a domestic Australian gun. Beyond that, not a whole lot. Uh, Australia used the Fowl and I believe the Mag 58 and a lot of um, FN guns um, as part of the, the British Commonwealth. So no, there wasn't a whole lot of other Australian stuff that was adopted and used in large scale, but the F1 is an example of it. Mark says, with modern materials and propellants, why haven't we seen a return of the rocket ball cartridge? Seems more logical than some of the caseless ammo exper experiments. Maybe not truly caseless, but much easier to design an action around and with most of the benefits. Uh, the reason is in-flight ballistics. If you are going, well, actually two things. First off, the idea of a rocket ball is that you have a bullet, and it's a relatively long bullet, and the base is hollow, and all of the powder goes into the base of the bullet, and the, you have some sort of primer compound on the back, and the bullet kind of acts as the cartridge case as well as the projectile. Now the rocket ball failed to be a success because it was substantially underpowered. In modern terms the problem you're going to run into, one is obturation. So without a brass case you have nothing really sealing the, the back of the, the, the barrel, um, or the back of the chamber where the bolt locks up. The, brass case, the primary purpose of the brass case is to seal the breech end of the gun from gas leakage. This is one of the uh, places where caseless ammunition experiments have problems, um, coming up with obturation mechanisms for them, uh, and a rocket ball would be no different. But I think a more substantial, more fundamental problem is that of in-flight ballistics. If you have a bullet where you have a heavy weight at the front and then a big hollow section at the back, it's going to be really hard to stabilize in flight, and it's going to want to flip around and probably fly tail first. Um, that wasn't an issue with the original rocket balls because they were quite short, um, short enough to avoid that problem I think. Um, but with a modern one, if you were trying to, yeah, having a big hollow section at the base of the bullet I think would be, would contribute to really unworkable ballistics. Sean asks, any idea of where I could purchase a stripper clip for my Bergman 1910-21? Yes, this is a serious question. I hand, mil hand load 9mm Largo and enjoy shooting it. Um, I would also very much like to find one. I don't have any good source. Um, there aren't... Uh, the Tokarev clips don't work for them effectively. Unfortunately, I got nothing, Mark. Um, if you find one, let me know. Or if you find a source that has more than one, let me know. Or if anyone else knows where one might find Bergman Bayard stripper clips, uh, let, let me know in the comments and I will share it with Mark. Because yeah, I have a 1910-21 as well, and no stripper clips, and one magazine, and I'd really like to have an effective way to reload the thing. Alright, next question is from Ian, a different Ian. Uh, if you were based in the UK and subject to UK gun laws, which he explains in a simplified manner are no cartridge handguns, no semi-auto centerfire rifles, and no machine guns, uh, then what historical firearms would you choose to collect? Ideally a collection you'd be able to enjoy shooting since hanging them on the wall is a non-starter in the UK. That's actually an easy question. These. Um, I, my understanding of British gun law is that I could pretty much have the same collection of French rifles there that I do here, uh, with the exception of the semi-auto Moss 44 and 49 and 4956 variants. Um, Berthiers, Labelles, Chasse-Pose, Gras, and Moss 36s, I believe, are all pretty well available in the UK. So that's my answer. I like them here where I can collect almost anything, and so I would like them in the UK as well. Uh, Thomas says, what firearm would you consider to be the one that got away? Well, I have two answers to that. First off, there's always stuff that I would like to have that I don't have the budget to buy, uh, and I don't consider that something that got away. Uh, if there's one thing that I've learned from handling as many different firearms as I have, it's that 
you'll pretty much always find another example of pretty much anything. So if you can't get it, don't worry, another one will show up sooner or later. However, there are two where mistakes on my part led to me not getting something that I really regret not having. It bugs me. Uh, one of them is actually just a magazine. Uh, a Bosnian fleur de lis uh, magazine. It's honestly, there's nothing particularly special about it, but these were a batch of magazines that were made during the Bosnian Civil War. They have a single big reinforcing rib on them, 30 round AK mags, and then they have a big fleur de lis stamp uh, at the bottom of the magazine. And they're super cool, and a small number of them came into the US through Sportsman's Guide back, boy, probably 10 years ago. And I bought a bunch of magazines from Sportsman's Guide at the time, didn't get one of the Florida Lees. But then, probably six years ago, I was at a gun show, and there was a guy who just had this milk crate full of AK mags and you know, 10 bucks a piece. And I saw a Florida de Lee mag in that crate and went, nah, I don't really need it. And now they're like $300 magazines, and they look super cool, and I'd love to have one, and I will probably never have one because I'm not willing to spend 300 bucks to get what is effectively an artistic AK magazine. So. I should, should, should have spent the 10 bucks and gotten that stupid one that I saw. Uh, the other example is a Type 30 North China rifle. This is a Chinese manufactured copy of the uh, Type 38 Arasaka carbine. There are two versions. There's an early one and a late one, um, a Type 19 and a Type 30. I have a Type 19. I would love to have a Type 30 as well. And there was one that came up at an auction, and I put a bid on it, and the gun sold for like, I think it was $500 that it sold for, which was an absolute steal in my mind. And I managed to put my bid on the wrong number, the wrong lot number. And so I won a generic Type 38 Arasaka for 500 bucks or for 550. My bid was higher than what that Type 30 sold for. And I would have gotten it um, had I double checked my, my uh, auction paperwork and made sure that I had the right number. And I didn't, and so I keep a picture of that stupid Type 30 rifle to remind myself to take the time to double check when I place bids on stuff at auctions. Uh, another one from Frank. Uh, why haven't we seen more variation in revolvers over the years? Looking at something like the Webley Fosbury and other automatic revolver ideas, or something like the 1895 Nagant, it doesn't seem like there's been much development on the core concepts once people move to cartridges. Meanwhile, with early automatic pistols, there seem to have been dozens of varieties and ideas thrown into the mix with varying degrees of success. Is there something about the revolver concept that just denies experimentation? Or are there several other innovative revolver ideas, other than just making them bigger, that I haven't seen? Um, I think, uh, honestly, Frank, I think you may be seeing them, but not really recognizing them. Because there have been a lot of different ideas in revolvers. If What's changed in semi-automatic pistols is typically the method of operation. What changes in revolvers is the method of loading. So we have, obviously we started with muzzle-loading revolvers, and there were cartridge conversions where you could disassemble the gun, remove the cartridge, or remove the cylinder to reload it. Then once we got cartridges, we really saw a wide variety of reloading options. You have uh, top brake revolvers with a hinge at the front. You have, I guess you'd call them top brake revolvers, but with the hinge uh, at the back. Guns like the, uh, the Mauser 1878. You have uh, loading gates. You have like the Abadie system, which is a loading gate that actually interacts with the trigger, so that you can use the trigger to cycle through the cylinder while loading it. Uh, you have automatic ejectors. You have manual ejectors. You have flip-out cylinders. You have something like the French 1892, which combines a loading gate and a flip-out cylinder. You have those cylinders coming out to the left and the right independently. Um, you have a couple of automatic revolvers or self-cocking revolvers that were out there, um, like the Webley Fosbury, uh, like the Mateba, and let's see what, what else was in there. There were a couple others that I had been thinking about. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is there was actually a pretty wide variety of different mechanisms of revolver. However, they all, from the outside, kind of look the same, or they don't look distinctive. You have to look a little bit more closely to see the differences. And I think that has led to people not really recognizing that there was as much diversity in the designs as there actually was. Uh, and our last question comes from Julian, who says, Hi Ian, if you were in World War I and were given the choice to carry any weapon that was in production at the time, what would you choose and why? A couple of different possibilities. Um, I'm going to go with an individual weapon, uh, rather than one of the many heavy machine guns. 
Um, and a lot of it depends on what would I actually be doing in World War One, um, because for some roles, something like a, a 0815 Maxim light machine gun would be an extremely viable weapon. Uh, if I was restricted to a bolt action, as I mentioned earlier in this very video, it would be a 1917 Enfield. Um, probably the two that would be most likely for me to look at would be the French 1917 self-loader. It was it has a bit of a historical reputation as a fragile and unreliable gun. Um, however, I believe that is largely due to being issued to troops that weren't really very gun-friendly sorts of guys. I think if you gave a 1917 to an experienced shooter who understood how to run it and what was fragile and what was not fragile, I think it could be a very effective weapon. Especially in World War One, I. I would love to have a self-loading arm and not have a bolt action. I think people sometimes underestimate just what how just how much of an advantage you get from a self-loading rifle over a bolt action. Uh, the other possibility would be a German MP18 because similar reasons. Um, Despite having relatively unreliable magazines, the MP18 gave you a huge amount of firepower at close range, uh, like pretty much like nothing else available in the war. So those would be my choices. It kind of depends what situation am I in. If I'm going to be in close combat, which is probably more likely, especially late in World War I, then it would be the MP18. So. Uh, thank you guys very much for submitting the questions. As usual, there were several times more questions than I was able to actually take. Um, if I do these videos too long, I'm going to entirely lose my voice. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, hopefully you learned something here today. Uh, if you do enjoy it, consider checking out my Patreon account. Uh, Patreon is what makes the channel possible, and it is Patreon that also gives you the opportunity to submit your own questions for Q&A videos like this one. So, thanks for watching.